uh, oh, <laughs> as a fourth speaker uh, of this season. And uh, Kian is, Professor Kian Go is a member of ArcDial 3, and uh, she's been very, very uh, uh, helpful and contributed a lot to our initiative. Uh, she's an assistant professor of urban planning. Am I right? Or your status is been Okay. Of the urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles, our school, and as associate faculty director of the uh, UCLA Laskin Institute of uh, in Equality and uh, uh, Democracy. And C research is urban ecological uh, design, spatial politics, and social uh, mobilization in the context of climate change and global urbanization. Dr. Goh's current research investigating the special uh, politics of climate with fieldworks in North America, Southeast Asia, and Europe. More broadly, her research interests include urban theory, urban design, environmental planning, and urban political uh, ecology. As a professional architect, she co-founded design firm Super Interesting and has practiced with the West Mount uh, Freddy and NVLDV. She received the PhD in urban and environmental planning from MIT and a master of architecture from Yale University. Dr. Go is the author of the book, Form and Flow, the special politics of urban resilience and climate uh, justice from MIT Press. So, you know, she just had a baby and she is being quite busy and I'm so glad that uh, uh, she could spend, you know, time with us today. So please welcome Professor Kiango. Thank you. Thank you, Hitoshi. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, great to be here and great to, to meet all of you. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to see, I think, successive years of the same initiative. So to, to look at how some of the ideas may have evolved. So I'm, I'm, I'm like happy to to be able to speak again to this to this cohort uh, who, who are part of the studio. So I thought what I would do today is talk about broadly about planning and urban climate change. And I think some of this will be directly related to some of the things that you all are doing in this studio and some may be more broad and more related, but I think at least uh, it will contextualize some of the issues that you're all are seeing within maybe a broader discussion about planning for climate change in cities. So uh, as Hitoshi said in the introduction, so I study uh, the, 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 the spatial politics about around urban climate change responses. So I look at what cities are doing uh, in response to climate change, usually large scale infrastructural or urban design plans. And I ask why we think that these are, that, that why these cities think that these are the right plans for the kinds of trends they face. And then I look at some of the politics on the ground, some of the conflicts around these plans and what community organizations may, uh, may be thinking as alternatives that may not be the same as the large scale plans that are proposed by the cities. So I'll, uh, I'll do a talk that starts with first a more general understanding of what, what I think, like how I see the field of of cities and climate change research. And then I'll talk about uh, some specific issues that are from my own research that, that is part of a book that I, that I just published. So I will share my screen. Oh, may I share my screen? Awesome.
So you would think that after doing this for so long, it would be so easy, but I'm missing it right now. Hang on. Carl, you're the host, right? I'm also the host at the moment. Oh, you're the host. Okay. Uh, for some reason, Zoom is not recognizing that my PowerPoint software is open. Oh, here we go. So you should see a window or a screen that says planning urban climate change. Awesome. So this is uh, so, uh, this is what I study basically, and I want to start by talking about what I see as six broad areas of climate change research just to situate what I work in, in my own research. And I think how you in this studio and other architects and urban designers who are dealing with issues of climate change and urban design and architecture in cities, uh, how you can see your own work in this broader context. So, so if I look at the field of cities and climate change, I might, um, categorize them in six different buckets of research. So these are, uh, this, is, this is basically what researchers are doing to try to understand what is happening in cities. So the first bucket, which I think is the most direct, would be basically about uh, what are the specific climate change impacts on or off cities. So cities are known as specific centers of population or infrastructure or culture or commerce. They are often seen as uh, different from places that are not called cities, for, let's say rural areas or places um, um, that are not as dense. And so, so researchers are tr try to understand, well, how is it that cities react differently to climate change impacts? And what can we do in cities uh, uh, because of that. So what are the particular uh, um, characteristics of cities that matter for climate change? So then related to that, a second area would be how do cities plan to mitigate or adapt to climate change? So if cities like the first area, area if cities can be understood as a, a, as a very particular kind of settlement, then okay, how can we understand uh, the ways in which city policies can help either to uh, mitigate the causes of climate change? So how can, how can we take use plans and policies in cities to reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions? Or how can cities change and adapt themselves in order to uh, face the impacts, so to adapt to the impacts of climate change, uh, because in, in, in many ways we're already seeing climate change impacts. Uh, so mitigate, mitigation itself will not get us out of trouble. We need to figure out ways to, uh, for cities to adapt to it. And I think this bucket, this number two, this bucket of research um, is the, the main part of what researchers and policymakers have tried to understand mitigation and adaptation in cities. So a third bucket, which I'm sure you've all heard about is how do cities become resilient? So this area of research looks at a broader set of issues around what might be called urban resilience, which is usually understood to be how cities bounce back from different shocks and stresses. 
Um, so this is related, I think, to ideas about adaptation in particular, but I think it's all it, it extends beyond that because people who talk about resilience uh, don't uh, don't usually confine themselves to talking about issues of climate change. They might talk about uh, about social strife, for instance, like violence in cities and how cities can be resilient to that kind of those kinds of issues. Or they might talk about economic collapse. So things that are not specifically climate related, but are shocks that we want the uh, cities to generally be able to respond to. And so this, on the face of it, seems like a good thing, right? Like I would mostly also want to want our cities to be able to withstand and to bounce back from from harmful things but there's also a number of folks who are starting to critique this idea of just bouncing back uh, so uh, researchers who are more critical are asking well if cities are part of the reason why we're in this problem to begin issues like climate change or social inequality, then why do we want to bounce back to the same conditions that got us into this mess in the first place? So these researchers who take this view uh, make the point that maybe bouncing back, just being resilient and bouncing back is not enough, but we need to think more broadly about better conditions that we want to attain, not just go back to the same uh, conditions that we used to be in. And then becoming, I think, more complex um, in, in this fourth bucket, how are historical and ongoing processes of marginalization and inequality in cities uh, both exacerbated by climate change, so made worse by climate change, and the responses to climate change. And I think this is a really interesting area of, of thinking and research that I've uh, myself been, been part of. So researchers are trying to understand how, you know, we already know, for instance, that poorer people, working class communities, mainly communities of color in the United States and in Western Europe, uh, poor working class communities around the world, will be impacted most by, the, by climate change. So by things like drought or heat waves or sea level rise. Um, and too often will also uh, suffer from the plans that we put in place to respond to climate impacts. And I think it's important to understand this because uh, it makes us aware that not all action is good action some actions taken by cities can make it worse for communities that have already suffered in the past. And what I'll talk about later in, later in the talk actually addresses this quite directly. So a fifth bucket, uh, which is a little bit more theoretical, it looks at some of the systems in, in urbanization. So how are processes of urban change intertwined with processes of environmental change, particularly in response to climate change. Uh, so really this area of work, which I think is super interesting, is trying to understand how the, the processes that we see around us in cities, processes of urbanization, like the growth of cities, is totally intertwined and cannot be disentangled from uh, processes of climate change. One way to understand this is that urbanization can be thought of as a critical part of the reason why we have rising uh, global carbon emissions and, and, and have since, you know, mainly the start of the industrial revolution. The, 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 the accelerated growth of cities is basically the same as the accelerated growth of emissions due to uh, that, that caused climate change. And that is an, int uh, an important uh, thing to understand because it means that if we want to solve climate change, if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have to take on uh, 
processes of urbanization. We have to change the way that urbanization and urban development happens. So it's a big deal. It's not just saying, oh, we can put a patch on it or we can rely just on technology to deal with it. We actually have to look at some foundational uh, um, ways that we, we build things and we live in cities. And then uh, a sixth bucket, the, the last one I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. This is about how cities are part of broader scales and levels of environmental change. So cities usually too often, in my view, are thought of as these very discrete objects almost. Like you look at Los Angeles and, you know, like we might be tempted to draw a line around Los Angeles, either the municipal boundaries or the county and say, that's it. So when we think about uh, mitigating or adapting in Los Angeles, we only look at that. We know in, at the back of our minds that, that that's not enough. Like these administrative boundaries, uh, like carbon emissions and environmental change, uh, they don't stop at, at administrative boundaries of cities. We know that. But we still, for ease and, and efficiency, we use that unit of the city to, uh, to measure, to uh, create policies, and to create plans. So this research explores how, you know, we have to think beyond that. We have to look at how the interconnections across different scales and uh, from one place to another are as important as looking within any kind of territorial boundary. So I've looked at this issue also, I mean, like the fact that I'm talking about these six buckets as being particularly important reflects my own, you know, like my own research interests and, and my own experience in, 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 in this field. So these six buckets of work, which are all related, but I think can also be pointed out as distinct. When you look at them, they bring up two things. For me, they bring up two things in particular. One is this idea of scale, and that, and, and that six bucket makes it especially clear that we need to think across different scales to fully understand the issues of climate change in cities and how we can deal with it. This is especially important when we're talking about, oh, who, who needs to be involved? Is this a community in one neighborhood? Is it a number of communities or neighborhoods? Is it the whole city? Or is it beyond that? So that idea of scale needs to be uh, really thought of. And then issues of justice. So increasingly, we found that not only does climate change, is climate change uh, unjust, meaning that the impacts of climate change are unequal, mostly poor people around the world who have the least to do with climate change, who have been least responsible for carbon emissions, will be first and most impacted. And the ways that we think about planning for climate change can oftentimes harm them even more. So, so issues, issues of scales and issues of justice, I feel arise for me as, it, as, as especially important and has really, and, and, the, and, and these two issues have really driven my own work. So I will pause there for a second and ask if, firstly, if there are any questions, just to like catch my breath, but also take any questions that may have come up. Maybe if I may, can I uh, jump in since this is a, just because I have a question on what you've just spoke about. It's um, on, on your on the topic of a kind of marginalization and inequality that's kind of exacerbated by um, climactic factors. Um, I think you're, you're, you're accurate, right? In, in, in staging, the, the urban conditions have to kind of anticipate different conditions in the future, right? And I think um, if that's folded into one of the, like one of your opening statements talking about redesigning or resiliency of, of future cities that is, is like a condition that is different than what we're familiar with, right? Like not building the same, but building for a different condition. Um, 
these two these two topics in particular, as they intersect each other, could be very important. Um, maybe in the next like 30, 40 years, I think it was uh, the Brookings Institute and together maybe with the World Bank, or maybe they were stating something from the World Bank who anticipates something like 140 million climate uh, migrants or, or climate refugees. And where these people go and where, you know, they're, they're inevitably gonna go into an existing place, probably most likely cities or urban areas mm -hmm. and what's gonna happen to them will, you know, inevitably set up different conditions, urban conditions that um, maybe need to be considered differently than you know, we have before. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a really good point. And, you know, a lot of climate change researchers have pointed out how a lot the, the the responses we can we can take always have to deal with uncertainty and 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 usually climate change researchers when they talk about uncertainty they they talk about the the fact that we largely know what will happen so scientists have looked at you know projections in in, in, in the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere and how that might translate to the warming of the oceans and, 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 and the melting of the ice caps and, you know, like shifting currents and shifting, and, and shifting wind patterns. So they know that and, and increased heat, of course. So that's what um, they know mostly about that, but they also point to how that's uncertain. There's always a range of uncertainty uh, and from the lowest impact to the highest, it's quite a lot. And yet we have to take actions. We have to, to decide which level we need to be, be looking at. Are we going to go all out to say, this is the worst case scenario and we're going to plan for it? Or will we say that, well, probably technological change will step in at some point and we can do a little bit less to, to, to mitigate or to adapt um, our cities. But then there's also, Carlo, the, the uncertainty that you bring up, which is that our societies and our cities will, very, will likely be very different because of the impacts that are ongoing. So there, there will likely be like, there already is starting to be mass migration, but there will conti be continuing mass migration, uh, the fact that we find it harder and harder to get water in Southern California will change the way we think about uh, how we do infrastructure. So there are these other uncertainties that may be compounding. And so when we as architects and designers, we're like, okay, how can I think about this? We, we need to really, in some ways, change the way that design processes happen to take into account uh, some of these compounded uncertainties. So I think it's it's quite interesting because in some ways, like architects, that that is related to how we've already done work. That you know we oftentimes go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and come up with different. Like we we do things iteratively, so we have some of the tools to do it, but but maybe we haven't uh, uh, come up with with the protocols to take on those kinds of new changes that you talk about. Um, like, especially like, I think, longer term societal change that might come about uh, because of climate impacts. And I think that that is a really interesting, like I, I think it's not, it's not something to throw up our hands and say like, we can't do it. It's something to, to, to say that, well, uh, maybe the ways that we've been thinking needs to change to take into account some of these issues. Okay, so I will continue and talk more specifically about the about the work that I have been about the research that I've been doing. So as Hitoshi said in the intro, so I recently published a book called Form and Flow, The Spatial Politics of Urban Resilience and Climate Justice. This came out two months ago from the MIT Press. And it, it encapsulates around eight years of work of research that I've been doing 
through the earliest years of my, when I was doing my PhD, through really last year or a couple of years ago. And the, the book looks at the spatial politics of urban climate change responses, in particular in three cities, New York, Jakarta, Indonesia, and Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And it looks at what I call a political ecology of design, which will be a little bit more clear as I talk through this. But it tries to understand each of these places not contained in and of themselves, but as these moments in a larger system. And I'll explain that more. So some context about these sites that, that I've been researching. So in New York, uh, especially post Hurricane Sandy in 2012, uh, one of the worst, you know, in quotes, natural disasters to hit New York, uh, city and state officials came up with ambitious plans to respond to climate change impacts. So coming up with, with initiatives such as Rebuild by Design, which is a competition uh, tasked with finding innovative solutions to sea level rise and stronger storms in the larger, the, the larger New York region. And this, is, this was a really interesting competition because it was one of the first really in the country that was uh, that was coordinated as part of a U.S. governmental agency. So in this case, the U.S. Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, HUD. And it focused on design as a, a potential solution. So the, the competition invited designer-led teams to propose solutions. And on the left, you see one of the more high-profile uh, win, winning proposals, uh, the big U for Lower Manhattan by the team led by architecture firm Big. And this comes alongside as well initiatives on the ground by community organizations and activists such as Occupy Sandy, uh, whose work to build up like a, a, a response to the storm from, from the ground up um, has been really well noted. So Occupy Sandy has been talked about a lot, but the ways that Occupy Sandy actually did that, you know, more ground up rather than top down um, has not really managed to influence some of the, the, the plans and policies that the city has been making. So then moving to Jakarta, Indonesia. So Jakarta floods all the time. So every, it floods every year, it's low lying and threaded through by 13 different rivers. So it floods every year and every five to seven years, there's a really massive flood. So after one of the floods uh, in uh, 2000, actually just after Hurricane Sandy hit New York in January 2013, the J Jakarta city officials actually with Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch diplomats and, and Dutch ministers came up with a proposal for a master plan for what's known as the Jakarta NCICD uh, giant seawall plan. So it's called the National Capital Integrated Coastal Development Plan, but more colloquially called the giant seawall. It is a large scale master plan that is authored by Dutch urban designers and infrastructure engineers. And it is shaped like from the air, like a, the Great Garuda, which is a, a, a giant, a mythical eagle that is Indonesia's national symbol. And uh, it is meant to be a new city for one and a half million people built on reclaimed land in the Jakarta Bay. So really, truly one of these, you know, like uh, um, mythical large scale master plans. At the same time, some of the most, the, the people most impacted by the floods in Jakarta are residents who live in the informal uh, kampong settlements, such as what you see on the right in Kampong Pulo, uh, 
where informal settlement residents generally are left to fend for themselves uh, when when hit by these floods. And they and Kampung residents have also had to 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 push back against city plans to excuse me, to evict them and to demolish their, their homes. And some of these Kampong residents have organized against eviction and displacement, coming up with plans of their own about how they want to uh, rebuild their Kampongs to respond to these floods. So I trace these uh, initiatives and these conflicts in New York and Jakarta back to the Netherlands where different changes, both environmental changes and political and economic changes have really transformed the way uh, that the nation state in, and cities in the Netherlands uh, think of themselves and as, as, as leaders or, or, or models for climate change. And I'll focus on this much more in a, in a little bit. So on the one hand, you might look at each of these cities, New York, Jakarta, and Rotterdam, and you think, well, yeah, they're sort of like maybe like roughly problems in parallel, like too much water but they're quite isolated, like they have nothing to do with each other. At the same time, if you dig a little deeper, you, we actually start to understand that, um, that these places are more connected than we might think. So they're connected by different relationships, different institutions at both global, at, 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 the, at the most global levels, and in some ways at a more local level. And so I will trace some of these connections uh, later in the talk, but I wanna point out how this unexpected situation, this interconnection between different places really, and, and the conflicts on the ground in them really brought me to, to, to think about uh, this for my research. So in the face of climate change and uneven social and spatial urban development, how are contesting visions of urban futures produced and how do they attain power? So how are these different visions of what people want to see in the future? How are they produced and how do they attain power? Why do we think that they, you know, like whose vision matters most in these cases? So I will spend the time in the talk to, to note three different aspects of this that I think are most salient. And they reflect actually three chapters of, of my book. So uh, if, you know, if you want, to, <laughs> you should actually read the book. It, it, it delves really deeply into these issues. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of this more like theoretical um, framing. I, I can come to it later, but it's basically, about what theories I'm looking for, looking to, and what methods. And I think it maybe uh, I don't have to spend the time now to go through each of them. But I'll talk about the three aspects to this story that I think are most critical. And the first is uh, really how conflict and contestation in these different places are formed. Like what makes uh, uh, conflict, what makes marginalization in different cities? So one of the things that, that I point out in this research is that even though the plans and proposals that, uh, that cities are coming up with in places like New York and Jakarta, even though they're oftentimes globally constituted. So you look at Rebuild by Design or you look at the Jakarta Giant Seawall and you see this uh, uh, really, this, this group of international figures and institutions coming together to do something. And even though they oftentimes try to, to do a very comprehensive plans, what in reality happens is that these uh, ambitious comprehensive plans get 
reformat it on the ground in the different sites and then tend to uh, actually uh, be in some ways constrained by the histories and the local spatial and social conditions. So on the left, Rebuild by Design tried to be um, really uh, like regional and comprehensive, but when it came down to it, each of the proposals that were the finalist proposals that were funded really had to bring their own uh, focus and their proposals down to very local areas. So even though they tried to be regional, uh, the politics of US municipalities and states really determined how they could even think about and make their plans. Uh, on the Jakarta front, uh, this giant seawall plan is, you know, meant to be really super ambitious and solve uh, flooding issues, trans transportation issues, housing issues, and all that. But when it comes down to it, it isn't uh, the 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 planners propose that it be built with no state, no public funding at all. So the, the Jakarta and Indonesian government, the Jakarta uh, regional government and the Indonesian national government would not have to pay money towards this plan. And instead, they, the proposal was for each of, was for the new reclaimed land to be sold, to be leased to private developers in order to make the money to pay for the project itself. So even though it is supposed to be ambitious, it is supposed to be this new national symbol, when it comes down to it, 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 it relies on what is really uh, the, the, the main way that Jakarta gets a lot of large scale things done right now, which is through privatization and relying on some of these uh, very big private developers to, to pay for it. Uh, so there's a conflict between the, 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 the big idea and the way in which it is uh, actually meant to be carried out. And you know we see a similar uh, conflict on the ground where, um the 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 people who have actually suffered most from the disasters that i pointed to the hurricanes and the floods are the ones that have the least say in what they want happen in these proposals so this includes public housing residents in brooklyn new york on the left uh where uh, residents in the Red Hook houses, this public housing project, had to deal with temporary boilers for years after the storm. Um, and, you know, so residents had to breathe in fumes from the boilers. They, they, they had to wait for repairs that are only just happening now, nine years after the storm. And then on the right in Jakarta, uh, informal settlement residents in these kampongs um, even though they are the ones who are impacted most from the, from the floods, don't have much to say about things like the giant seawall land. So, so that's one aspect. And, and I would just say that the, means, the, 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 the main point from this is that historical power relationships in these different cities tend to really inform and constrain the kinds of plans uh, that can be proposed for them. So the second point is about the, the flows and the interconnections between these places. So uh, on so so you you know I didn't necessarily mean to study the Netherlands when I started this project. I was looking at things happening in New York, I was looking at things happening in Jakarta. But no matter where I turned, there would be a, a, oftentimes a Dutch government official or a Dutch uh, engineer or designer. So you see on the, on the left here, Minister Schultz, who then was the uh, Dutch was a, the Dutch minister in charge of uh, of um, infrastructure and environment uh, as part part of the signing of the Jakarta Giant Seawall Plan. And you see Minister Schultz again, 
uh, on the right, signing a memorandum of understanding with US HUD Secretary Sean Donovan on cooperation between the Netherlands and the United States on, on spatial planning and water management. And of course, you know, for those of you who may know about the Netherlands, have, may have been to the Netherlands, maybe this is not that surprising. So the Netherlands has been known as a, a kind of like leader in water management um, since, you know, a third of the, the country is actually below sea level and uh, the, and 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 different and 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 they have and Dutch people have been building dikes and draining uh, land for for eight hundred years, and especially recently since uh, a, the uh, a large flood in nineteen fifty four, they've started on the left what's called the the Delta Works, a very ambitious set of dikes and dams to protect the some of the most populous areas in the southwest of the country. And this in some ways have been shifting because of climate change and because of global economic shifts where you also see these days initiatives such as Room for the River on the right where uh, designers and engineers have attempted, rather than raising dike levels to protect from more uncertain precip precipitation, they have uh, planned to ease some of the, the dike protections and, and actually allow some occasional flooding to happen. So these ideas about water management have 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 been have been raised and 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 been part of Dutch expertise for a long time now, uh, but but what you see at the moment as well is a uh, focus increasingly on the cities, not so much the Dutch national plans such as the Delta Works, but uh, but Dutch officials pointing out examples in the cities themselves, such as this water square in Rotterdam on the left, uh, uh, which is basically a, an infrastructure space that can also, that, that deals with uh, too much water from cloudbursts, but can also serve as a recreational space, so a dual use space. And on the, on the right, you see, Dutch officials pushing the message out and looking outward towards an, a more international community, trying to make their claim as, uh, as engineers and designers for climate change. So if pr prior plans used to be more national in focus, now you see a, a focus increasingly on the cities themselves and an outward focus to the world, trying to make this claim about Dutch expertise. And you definitely see this uh, when you dig into the plans that I talked about, both Rebuild by Design in New York and the Jakarta uh, Giant Seawall Master Plan, where Dutch officials such as Henk Ovink, who is the principal of Rebuild by Design, um, and a number of teams have significant Dutch involvement. So I think six of the 10 teams that were involved in Rebuild by Design have uh, significant Dutch expertise. And if you look at the, at, on the Jakarta side, the primary master plan team and program management unit uh, that, that was tasked with some of the more social aspects of the plan were uh, were led and staffed by uh, Dutch firms and institutions. So really, what is going on here? To me, what you see is really like if we if we look at this uh, you know idealized model of nation states on one level and cities on another, what we start to see is a a breaking of these levels with in Dutch 
public and private institutions such as the Netherlands Water Partnership, a public-private partnership that's tasked with making these economic development uh, agreements happen, or DELTARES, which is a Dutch research institute that is funded often uh, through public means, but can be part of private consortiums taking on projects. And, and other organizations who start to pull the, the global level, this, this level of nation states, and the urban level, this level, this, this, uh, level of cities together. And so often national policies can be implemented and can be pushed forward by pointing to some of these urban projects, such as the water squares. And I think it's a, an interesting note because in, especially in, in planning, many folks are saying, oh, look to the cities. Like if the nation state doesn't want it, and we see that in the US, if the nation state doesn't want to do anything about climate, look at how the cities are taking the lead. But this, uh, this point here, make, the, the, the point I'm, I'm making through this research is that it's not always clear the separation between the nation state and the city. And in fact, many national policies are actually tuned through what we, con we consider to be urban projects. Okay, and then one final point, <clears throat> getting a little bit hoarse here. So this is about the, the envisioning, really the design of these projects. So let's see, I will, okay, I'll make this point using the Jakarta giant seawall plan. So on the one hand, you see that you know, these plans are quite idealized. So the Jakarta Giant Seawall Plan is meant to be this kind of like graceful eagle that's uh, rendered by um, uh, using, you know, like these white buildings and greenery uh, protecting the old city behind it. And if you look at some of the, the the sketches behind these, these plans. So here's a sketch by the, uh, the urban designer and landscape architecture firm, Kuiper Companions for the plan. And it's much more free form and gestural. And in some ways, some of the precision of the renderings uh, is, is taken out here. And, and it's a much, in some ways, a much more visceral plan about uh, symbol and 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 in some in some ways like meaning evoking both the form of the eagle and as well the the form of the coastline in the plan itself. And I'm gonna oh wait let me I think I got some of my slides mixed up a little bit here. Okay, let me let, let me take a let me reframe some of that. So, when you talk to uh, the designer of this Jakarta Giant Seawall Plan, even though it is a project that is largely top down, so funded by the Dutch government, involving many. Uh, Dutch uh, urban designers and landscape architects and, and, and engineers, they mean it for it to be an Indonesian project, right? So the fact that it is named, uh, colloquially, it's named the Great Garuda, so uh, evoking this mythical eagle that's the, the Indonesian national symbol, is to make it more reflective of an Indonesian project. So they use design in this way to try to appeal to, uh, to both Jakarta and Jakarta city and Indonesian national government interests so that they would buy into the project. 
But at the same time, it doesn't really take into account some of the voices on the ground, those uh, the residents of the informal kampong settlements that I mentioned earlier. And in fact, you'd also see kampong activists using design to come up with their own, in a different way, to come up with their own vision of what they want to see in, in their neighborhoods. So here you see architect Yuli Kusworo, who is a community-based architect working with some of the kampong residents to come up with models for housing that would be affordable uh, for kampong residents who are, who are largely the, the urban poor and be stacked and higher density in order to uh, cl clear and make some room for better drainage of the rivers and canals. So what they've tried to do is to say, okay, uh, we don't, well, well, we reject the premise that we have to be moved out of our neighborhoods. Here's how we can come together to design for ourselves uh, a way forward. So to design a more dense kampong settlement that is attuned to the social relationships that, that, that kampong communities have already developed. And this actually uh, turned, in, turned out to be an important point. So Sandiawan Sumardi, which is, who is an activist with this group called Chiliwong Merdeka, uh, that organizes residents in one of these kampongs, said that, you know, quote, for years, the urban poor in Jakarta had a very negative stigma that they were considered lazy, passive, and illegal. But we proved that a collective planning process with plans and mappings could be made for the, by the community themselves in ways that were concrete. So you see uh, uh, the two sides of how design is used to build power and to make claims about specific projects. So on the one hand, you see the designer of the giant seawall using design as a way to appeal to Indonesian cultural history and to Indonesian identity with this idea about the great Garuda. And then, and then kampung activists and community architects using design in a way to appeal to the more concrete ideas that uh, in order to make claims of city officials. So putting numbers to things, putting form uh, to, to their political, uh, to their to their political campaigns. So for Sandiawan Sumardi, this ability of kampong residents and community architects to make these plans were a big part of being able to make a claim to remain in their neighborhoods. And I'm gonna skip through these and just point out just to end uh, to end this part of the talk, you know, are there alternatives to some of these, uh, to some of these, the, 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 either the, 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 the top down or, or simply like a, a, or a, well, is there an alternative to the initiatives that I talked about earlier? So one, example that I will mention is one that I, I'm personally very familiar with. So 10 years or so ago, I worked with this organization called the Red Hook Initiative in Brooklyn, New York to design and build a community center for the organization. And RHI, Red Hook Initiative, works largely with youth who live in public housing in Red Hook, Brooklyn, who are residents of the Red Hook houses. And, and we came up with a plan that was with community members, so in consultation with, and was meant to be owned by them. And so when Hurricane Sandy hit and Red Hook was one of the neighborhoods that was most impacted, I was, uh, I was quite worried about 
uh, the residents of Red Hook, the constituents of RHI and the space itself. But the RHI space actually survived the storm pretty well, even though the floodwaters came up right up to that block. And in the days after uh, the storm actually turned into a center of neighborhood recovery. So RHI staff worked with volunteers such as Occupy Sand, those from Occupy Sandy to, uh, to start a soup kitchen for neighborhood residents. And the staff also worked with, with, with uh, disaster recovery officials such as the, the officials from FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management uh, uh, Group to, to turn the Red Hook Wi-Fi network, which is a community built network into an emergency communications backbone for FEMA officials. So neighborhood staff and, and from, from RHI actually uh, were a critical part of building back and, and, and making a resilient space after the storm. And I was really interested in how they were able to do this and what Jill Eisenhardt, the executive director of the Red Hook Initiative, told me is that they prepared for this way before, but not for a storm. They prepared uh, for it through this idea of resilience as uh, as building as a, as as a as a building of social capital among themselves. So they would say to. Uh, to the youth who live, who are their, their youth constituents, that you know, uh, no one's going, no one's going to help them. They well, they have to be able to stand up for themselves. But if they can't do it, that they have a community around them to help them do it. And so they built this social capital in the years before the storm. And when the storm hit, that they did not predict, they were able to build on that social capital to uh, to become to 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 take on this recovery effort in in a way that was quite that was quite meaningful and productive. So I'll I'll stop with just uh, some 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 of the key findings that I that came out from this research. So the the main one is that when we look at this new world of climate policy that we're encountering uh, and, and the, the flows of ideas um, between different places, these climate change response strategies, while possibly globally constituted, so produced through these global institutions and global actors, are embedded within and reflect local, urban, soci sociocultural systems and networks. So really, these broad globally uh, constituted plans are reformatted as they hit the ground in different places. And it's important to understand the histories and, 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 the, and really this, the social and physical conditions of these places. Climate change facilitates uh, new avenues for exchange. Uh, social, cultural, political, and, and economic exchange. So climate may motivate the plans, but the plans objectives often transcend climate specific goals to embrace broader agendas. So you definitely see, for instance, the economic agendas that are embedded in some of these climate plans. And then lastly, that, uh, that design is political. So design is, is a terrain over which you have these contesting spatial agendas uh, that can be then visualized and prioritized. So, you know, on the one hand, I would caution architects and designers from thinking that design is, uh, you know, like all, that, the, that design is the be all and end all of doing this work. But I would also say that we need to understand that, that, that design has power and is political and the ways in which we create these visions of the future um, have the ability to be part of political claims when we do it 
with and alongside uh, activists and organizers who are trying to build those political movements. So the production of alternative visions enables modes of organizing and resistance to uh, plans and projects that may be unjust or, or exclusionary. So I will stop there and then hopefully we can have a broader conversation about this and maybe try to link it to some of the work that the studio is doing this, this fall quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from you guys? I mean, I just simply have a question. I know that the, now Indonesia decided to move the capital up to the higher ground, right? And then this is like a seemingly, I think it will be funded by the government funding. So this is like a third choice in a way, right? The, the Garuda is more developer oriented project, which is kind of a white versus gray ground. And it looks really, in a way, a little bit horrifying to see that juxt strong juxtaposition of the sort of a socially strong versus socially vulnerable. And then uh, the activity of the comp compound area and of this bottom up things to probably, I assume by implementing the more uh, uh, resilient sort of uh, uh, community hubs and resilient uh, housing and in, in increases the resiliency of the communities, the other approach, but then this moving the entire sort of city to high up. Yeah. I'm just curious how people are responding to this. Mm. I mean, is it, you know, just uh, if you can kind of yeah. talk about this a little bit. Yeah, so Hitoshi, that's a really interesting point. So Hitoshi is pointing out how, uh, how the Indonesian president Jokowi announced, I think about two years ago, a year and a half ago, that Indonesia would move its national capital from Jakarta to the neighboring island of Borneo. So to a pre basically a, a fairly, um, like a previously un, un in, well, either uninhabited or quite sparsely inhabited part of Borneo Island. So I say, you know, like neighboring island, but these Indonesian islands are actually like quite massive. So Borneo uh, Island is this uh, massive island that part part of it, part of which is Indonesia, part of which is Malaysia and Brunei. And so the idea is really to 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 wholesale move the capital to a new uh, greenfield development on another island, which right now. It's not really very, uh, it, 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 at least in that part of the island, not, not, not a particularly densely populated one. So I think two things. So, and, and they, they haven't, you know, they're still in the planning stage for this. I've, I've heard from some folks who are aware of the planning process, although I haven't actually seen the, the plans themselves, but it sounds like a fairly, you know, um, like a, if, if, if one can say a typical capital planning project. So one of these like, you know, ideal cities to, to be the, the face of the nation state. So a couple of things. So one is that they're moving the capital, but they're not moving the whole city. So Jakarta has been and the Jakarta, well, Jakarta and and actually like the whole western part of of, of, of Java Island, which Jakarta is on, is the economic driver of of the country. And Jakarta very much is like the the political has been the political and economic driver. And so moving this the capital itself does not immediately change that. So, and so it is, and it doesn't immediately depopulate mm. Jakarta or solve its flooding problems. So moving the capital itself may, may 
well, it may happen, but it's not going to uh, to 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 mitigate or take away the flooding problems that Jakarta already has. What it does, I think, is it relieves the capital, the the seat of power, from having to deal with some of these urban problems uh, that Jakarta is facing now. So you kind of have like this fresh start. So something else will have to happen in Jakarta itself, regardless of whether the capital is moved. I think the other big thing about Jokowi saying that he's planning to, to, to do this is to, in some ways, to rebalance and reclaim uh, power, power over the whole country. So, you know, like Jakarta, I mean, Indonesia is like, a series of like sprawling islands and there is often and like political strife at the edges of of the country uh, and i think moving the capital is as much a way to like literally recenter the seat mm. of political power in the country away from what is now really like the both like this cotton together the political and economic center and I like see. and if you think about how other countries have done this like when you, you know the clearest example is probably like brazil like when yeah when brazil you know when when it moved its capital to brasilia you know it didn't necessarily change the the economic uh prospects that much of cities like I think Sao Paulo is probably the 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 economic like the the main economic driver of Brazil so so some of it is like a resituation of political power mm -hmm. but in some in some ways the the social the social issues that 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 these cities face will continue they'll shift but they'll continue I see but it's interesting so the the it's a kind of a political statement from the government almost like a turning garuda project to much higher level i, I think mean, so of embracing the jakarta only now they're trying to embrace the entire country through this capital I, I think it's a way to i i think it's a way to 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 continue to to make a claim on on national power that's you know i've not talked to any of the officials involved in this but like mm. that that knowing like at least like how indonesian politics has has progressed in in the last couple of decades it seems like that would would be at least part of it i mean i'm sure part of it too it's like uh you know it's a it's a challenge to manage a whole very big sprawling country from an urban center that is continually at risk. So that is definitely for sure. Like if you do move the seat of power, you don't have to deal with the fact that uh, the 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 biggest city in the country is sinking and and facing floods. So that 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 could also that's certainly also part of it. But does this kind of a capital, I mean, uh, project will actually influence the uh, Garuda project? Definitely, well, right? Yeah, I mean, content. definitely. But also, and I couldn't tell the whole story here, but the, Gar the Garuda project has also transformed quite a bit because of local Jakarta politics. So the the most ambitious form of it with the giant eagle and the city for 1.5 million, that's basically done. Um, right. and, and it is done for a couple of reasons. They, over time, there was, they, they face increasing conflicts from community organizations, such as the ones I talked about um, claiming that the project doesn't really solve some of the biggest issues, which has to do with the over pumping of groundwater and the, the and land subsidence in Jakarta, and that the project threatens to harm the mangroves and and fisheries along the coast. Hmm. So, in the last election, 
for Jakarta governor, governor, so the regional, the, the capital region government, um, one of the candidates actually signed a political pact with, with some of the kampong organizers. Uh, and the pact was around, you know, like basically like we will garner support for your campaign if you uh, make a promise not to proceed with some of these reclam reclamation projects. And if you uh, put some attention to these existing kampongs and ease some of the labor laws around uh, like informal food, uh, food vending and things like that. So, and, and he won this candidate, Anis, mm. who, who made this political pact. I mean, there are other aspects to this, but basically the candidate who made this political pact with the urban poor won the election and has put in some initiatives uh, to both to halt the reclamation work and to rebuild some of the kampongs in place in a in a in a more in a like a more socially attuned high rise project. So there are shifting things. So the 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 flood project goes on, but it is much more scaled mm -hmm. back. And you know the the this it's not clear yet whether that's enough because the sinking the land subsidence that's really driving a lot of these problems is still continuing. I see. So uh, this issue of sort of conflict between the master plan sort of top-down approach is solved the bigger problem versus the uh, bottom-up kind of community-based projects that happened in Japan also. And, and the last year we had a, a person from Big in charge of Big U project. And she kind of described that the how actually the, the bigger kind of idea was adjusted through the series of committee meetings and so on. So in a way, right, you, we need a both way of coming in, right? And uh, it was kind of interesting to hear, and I'm kind of curious to learn more about how that big U project, which is relatively kind of applying uh, huge infrastructure into, I think very strong, still sort of a, a influential communities. So yeah, I I wonder. So I I who who came from big? Christy, Christy. Okay, I don't uh, think. For, uh, no, no, sorry. Um, I should forgot. Not that was from OMA. Uh, the gentleman. God, uh, Carl, do you remember? the one who was initiating the whole thing um shoot oh i think was it jeremy? Met him. jeremy jeremy Jer jeremy okay okay so so yeah no i i think that that that, that is an interesting case i also write, write about that more in the book but the the big new project it's an interesting example because they do and and we the the big architects the architects from big talk about how they learn from their community engagement process and in fact i talked to one of the community activists who had been part of this engagement process with uh, the big team and she said and her, her name is damaris reyes from this organization called good old lower east side and she said that the engagement process actually went quite well like the big team were open, they came back, they, they changed their plans uh, in response to community interests. And so the community organizations who are in a coalition called Lower East Side Ready, they signed mm -hmm. on and they said, yeah, um, uh, good, or at least like good enough, we were on board. But then immediately, like when it went into the implementation phase and 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 the the uh and then was turned over from rebuild by design to the city to handle its procurement and implementation mm -hmm. process there were other conflicts that came up 
So oh, really? you, yeah, so so part of it was on the phasing and the timing of of, mm. of the big U. Like it was broken up into several different right. projects. And big still is in charge of this one part of it called the mm -hmm. East Side Coastal Resilience Project. Right. And um even now, like if you go to this site along the East River in New York, you'll see like spray painted protest um, statements like stop ESCR. It's not a flood, you know, it's not a flood protection plan. It's a scam. Like there's still some, some ongoing mm -hmm. conflict. I mean, part of this maybe, you know, in, in some, some of it may be inevitable. Like some people just don't like change. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, no matter how they do this, this coastal project, it's going to be, there's going to be some fairly significant impact. But I think mm -hmm. the, the, the other, I think more important aspect to this is that uh, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't structured that kind of engagement in a way that will have continual impacts throughout the implementation process. So we may have decent, like good engagement with community or organizations right. at, at one design phase, but then it goes into like another phase of engineering, another phase of value engineering, another phase of, uh, of, of, of scheduling. And some parts of the project change and community organizations feel like they were not then part of that continuing uh, like like revisions and the way that cities do urban development right now is you know in some ways like inherently like like they're, they're, they're like we have, like our cities are becoming more and more unequal like we, we don't know how we, we haven't changed the way we do it in order to actually like benefit those who, are, who have been been harmed most so there's like a kind of like built-in skepticism uh, mm -hmm. about these projects and and whenever anything changes you know you know people are often rightly upset and 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 questioning saying like why did this change again after we garnered these agreements in the past and yeah, I'm 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 so interested also in the in in what's going on in Japan. Like I just, you know, some of the ongoing coastal work uh, is still is, you know, I think the 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 protests are probably different, but there's still disagreements about how how to protect the coastline. Yes, actually, uh, talking about the Japanese case, it's always right. There's a different kind of, uh, um, how to say the, uh, like a time, for instance, as time passed by, people started to get really anxious about it. So if somebody tells you, if we do this big wall, and you can come back and live like it was, then most people kind of agree with that. So the, the Japanese tend to be more, how to say, uh, uh, obedient to the top-down mm. decisions. And also there are certain sort of a problem, but the, uh, last week or the last week, the professor is from Tohoku presented that the professor Onoda's presentation was about I mean, successful development or the reconstruction versus the unsuccessful one. And he said that actually after the reconstruction, the certain area, most of the vital part was gone just that because they need to relocate everything. And, and then what's left is something really um, just, you know, the attractive, uh, you know, and it cannot stop maybe the losing its population mm. uh, versus to the other area, which was very more, much more successful in the reconstruction plan was uh, the area with strong local stakeholders existing and being, being vocal 
to mm. kind of balances and then pushes some of the urgent sort of a uh, kind of kid apart type of uh, uh, top down planning and say, let's wait, let's not do that seawall so high. I, you know, so also there was a kind of a negotiation process uh, between the local community group versus to the uh, sort of uh, uh, authorities and then they found a way to balance the local context and the reality with the more kind of conceptual sort of a strong large scale gesture. Yeah, it must be so I'm interesting. You talk about places that have like cohesive community, um, like a com like community structures that are able to to maybe engage better and, and make claims more strongly. And I'm thinking about just like the what we hear about a lot, like depopulation of different areas in Japan. Like it's hard to maintain cohesive communities when it's shrinking, right? I think that right. that's probably one of the, the key issues. Yeah, I, I think he said uh, it was very important for the success of the reconstruction to have strong voice, the strong local leaders. Yeah. So yeah. that then, and then some of the area where it, you know, just didn't have such kind of leader, and then the, this kind of a generalization and the application of the conceptual idea of relocation and so on just pushed a lot of a, a unique aspect of the local area away mm. and turned it into really sad looking sort of a, a environment. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, like, how might some of this be related to the sites and the problems that you all are working on this quarter? Oh, let me explain. This quarter, yeah. they haven't really picked up any site yet. They are mm -hmm. working on more conceptual idea about the, what the regenerative urbanism can be. So they are putting some presentation by sort of, uh, how to say, two come up with a keyword which might contribute to define the idea of okay. regenerative urbanism and then by using some examples. And then also they are initiating the case study of the fire. So they are an analyzing uh, three fires in the Napa area and uh, it's especially one of those uh, giga fires and things like that. So. Uh, we just kicked off and uh, this studio is a research studio. So it's a one year long, two quarters of the research and one quarter of design. So they are in the beginning of the research phase. So, but uh, they were exposed to a series of talks and uh, conversations and uh, uh, your students, Antara is helping us also to create the archive. So I, I, I'm sure, you know, Guys, I think it's a very rare opportunity. I don't think Kian will come back to campus, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, this is for a while. So if you really want to jump in, please. Um, I guess just for like our own research, I'm also very interested in um, what we just discussed, the top down and bottom up approach and how we balance that. So I'm just wondering if there are any successful examples that you can share with us where like a big initiative um, gets carried out um, where you know like it's conflict with the local communities gets minimized so that just you know just for our future research we would like to look at some of those case studies yeah i think you know that's a perfect question of course i think that's one of the big issues that that so many of us are trying to work through. So, so in the Jakarta case, one project that has gone on that seems to be more successful is this rebuilding of one of the settlements called 
uh, kampong aquarium, basically aquarium kampong. And this is one of the kampongs that had been demolished a few years ago. And because of the activism among some of these kampong organizers, they managed to garner an agreement with uh, city officials to build back uh, housing that is co-designed with uh, activists and residents in the kampongs. So when you see some of these buildings, I think the, the first one opened maybe two months ago or so, like they are on the one hand, they, they are, you know, definitely like these uh, housing blocks, housing block models, but they are designed in a way that uh, that enable more of the activities and the, the relationships that are part of the existing kampong to be to be to to take over to take on. So more open spaces, more shared spaces, more spaces for um, for like home businesses that are part of many of these 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 kampong areas and and so and and because it's rebuilt it's rebuilt away from some of the more threatened or the more vulnerable riverfront areas so so that you know one of my uh the phd students i'm working at working with at ucla in geography dian she has been part of the organizing there. And judging by how she has talked and, and, and shown some of this, that they are, they're quite happy about how that has gone. So that is one example where, where these community members have actually like uh, managed to, to wrestle some power and, and, and make and, and, and change the way that a redevelopment happens. In terms, you know, looking back to a different, different, um, like in some ways, like a different era. There, there was for a while, you know, when you, when you, uh, when you ask, like, okay, what is a good example of top down and bottom up? people might point to this example in Bangkok, Thailand, the Ban Mang Kong rebuilding effort where community, a community along a canal actually came together to replat, so like redraw their settlement and rebuild in a way that was more that was more secure and 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 safer for the long term and this like ban mang kong project is like written about in in many books on on how we can better engage uh communities on the ground so i would certainly like take a look at take a look at that i mean you know in some ways like i you know, and I, and I point out, for instance, like the Red Hook project, I think the Red Hook initiative project, I think is reason like a reasonably successful one. I do take the point of view that like, these are, these are not really like, they're, they're not quite enough that we need to look to them and hold them up, you know, like point to them as good examples, but we also have to, think more long-term about the kinds of threats that climate change does pose and consider what better examples that are even more long-term into the future might look like. So some of these more local examples, good examples may not be enough to really change our cities in the, in in the transformative way that we that we need to so hold them up and 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 yeah point to these good examples but also think about what would it mean to even do it in a more systematic way uh in the way that we plan cities and design buildings i would also look at you know there's a an organization in Sunset Park 
in in New York City called Uprose, U P R O S E, and uh, the executive director of Sunset of of Uprose is this woman Elizabeth Yam Pierre. Maybe I can put this in the chat. And Yam Pierre is like this really like totally inspiring person. Uh, we had her come to the we had her come to the planning conference to, to keynote the planning conference, our, our big planning conference a couple of weeks ago. And she talked about how Uprose, their organization, advocated for and as for, for with you know their community constituents advocated for different like climate mitigation policies for New York City and as well new energy projects so advocating for an offshore wind project in new in 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 New York and she pointed out how like her voice I think is uh has been one of the strongest that I have heard for how planners and designers can work with and for movement builders. Like when, when someone asks her, so that how can planners, how can planning students start movements? And her response was, you know, movements are already, they, you don't have to start it because they're already there. You need to figure out a responsible way for you to be part of them. So, you know, don't talk over, uh, you know, move social movement, uh, people who, who are leading social movements, figure out how your skills and your um, efforts can be part of the change that they want to make. And I think what I like about the work of Uprose is it's not just a local thing. They're campaigning and advocating for changes in how New York City and New York State does its uh, deals with its energy, deals with its uh, building codes. So it's, it's really, I think, more systemic approach to, to organizing from below. And they are making, you know, helping to make change on, from, from, on, a, on a, you know, high gut, like a, what, what we would generally consider to be like a top down level. Yeah, it's it's interesting actually to think about how you measure the success and the failure because it's an ongoing process, right? So if there's a problem and then there's somebody protesting it. If there's a communication, there's always a room to turn it into much better situation and so on. And also it's really difficult to see this is the successful or maybe there's a certain successful cases, but like as Kian said, it supposed to create a much larger kind of a uh, sort of a context and because the urban activity is more complex and so on. So it's easy to talk about like a small successful project, but as a whole, you know, it's a, we are still not sure how each successful project can create this entire ecology to change the uh, and improve our our environment. So, uh, for instance, the recovery in Japan, uh, Kamaishi or Minami Sanriku are the ones that uh, lots of sort of a, a different kind of a challenge was made, not only from the authorities but local community. Kamaishi. They hired Toyo Ito as a design director, and there's a lot of work being in, in, in poured in. Minami Sanriku had a really interesting mayor who is very conscious about this type of. Uh, so, I don't know if you could get the spelling Kamaishi City and Minami Sanriku. <laughs> it's a little bit too long. I mean, can we, you we, put it in the chat? <laughs> ah, okay. have time. Yeah. Well, I'm not the chat person, so sorry for this. <laughs> uh, maybe while I'm typing, you know, please, you know, if 
somebody else. So I don't know if this is still kind of the thought, but I feel like at one point there was discussion of, oh, urban centers are great because you can concentrate all of the necessary um, utilities and resources into one space as opposed to kind of spreading everywhere. But then there's also the issue of kind of like the urban change, urban growth leading to environmental issues. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of wondering about like, like the effect or like the relationship maybe between like the population growth as opposed to urban growth and like is it still better to have dense urban centers even if it is leading to environmental change like I don't I don't really know how to phrase kind of a question about that but like the relationship between those two yeah, I mean, I, I know, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So many folks say like, oh, it's better to be to live in uh, big, dense cities, your, your impact will be lower, and we can like, pull together all the kinds, like the resources, the, the infrastructure, and, you know, things like that. And I think there's some truth to that. So you know, like the big argument is like, oh, if people live in dense, compact neighborhoods, they can walk places, they can take public transportation, they don't have to drive everywhere, that kind of argument. I think it is true and it is also a bit overstated. Like, um, it's like a, like for me, it's like a yes, but uh, statement, you know, uh, a, fr a friend and you know like very extended colleague of mine Daniel Aldana Cohen who he's a sociologist who just took a position at Berkeley he and others have been working on what they call a kind of like carbon consumption footprint of cities and in their early studies they have pointed out how when you look at places like New York City, the places that have the least carbon footprint may not be the densest, but maybe some of the uh, like slightly less dense, but in some ways the, 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 the less wealthy neighborhoods around the city that have not changed as much. And in fact, it could be that some of the denser parts of the city where a lot of the infrastructure is concentrated and these days a lot of wealthier residents are living, um, that their consumption-based carbon footprint is actually higher. So their point is that, you know, we have to look at, we have to look more more comprehensively at what at what's going on we we don't just look at like the built environment pattern we also need to look at you know like the uh, at, at at consumption and what and what's happening there i, I do yeah. you know have they looked at like other cities in comparison to new york because i wonder what like the like carbon consumption footprint of say new york versus hong kong versus yeah. London, like other denser cities versus Tokyo. I don't know. So I'll I'll put in the chat the the work that I know that they have done. And this is from Daniel's previous job when he was at Penn. So he just moved to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I know he's going to be like doing some more of this work there. Mm -hmm. But um, so I don't know if they've done any more like comparative studies of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, actually, Kian's time is running out. So if you guys want to ask one last question, is that okay uh, or? guys with uh, just only names. I hope you guys are <laughs> there. Okay. So um, then thank, oh, so I uh, wanna, you, you have any question? Is it okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Any, or, 
Any questions? Claire, All I think right. you are trying to say something. We didn't your your yeah, you're not muted, but, but yeah, so not audible. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess my question would be since we're designing these hypothetical projects, um, and you know, we won't necessarily be holding like public town halls or meetings, how we can sort of embed the projects with the capacity to not be this top-down approach. So, so one way might be, you talked about in Jakarta, they have these open spaces and community spaces. So perhaps, you know, designing a project that can be very flexible um, is a way to avoid that. Um, but I guess just wondering if you had any advice. Yeah, that's a good question. And I get that question quite a lot in the one, you know, I teach at site planning, urban design studio in the planning department. And often, and it's one quarter, right? So 10 weeks, you all have 30, 30 weeks. When, when you have 10 weeks, like you don't, you know, it's hard enough to even to, 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 to bring any kind of project to a close in 10 weeks. So the engagement that we're able to have is minimal to none. And I tell them like, um, you know, what's worse than not doing like a community engagement project is uh, initiative is, doing one for a project that is not going that that's not going to go any like when you're doing a studio project the understanding is this is a way to explore different ideas it usually is not a project that will be implemented so in my view it is often not really feasible or responsible to ask people to be to engage with you if ultimately they're likely not gonna get much out of it. So one way that we've talked about this for, for my site planning studio is to think about the process of engagement and how that would change uh, the way that you and possibly, and we, we always work in teams in that site planning studio, like you and your team does your design work. So, you know, how can, you know, instead of, designing one perfect solution, design a process that includes engagement or a, a, a matter of engagement and uncertainty in it. And I think about the designers and architects who have been doing work in like informal settlements in India or, or in, like, you know, you, I think you can see some examples in South America where you, you want to show the possibilities of design, but you don't want to state that you have the ultimate solution. So you show a design framework and you show some possibilities, like depending on some priorities, maybe it can go in different ways. And it still exists and it still can be a successful project even if it takes one of a few uh, few directions. And I think that that's pretty interesting because it's also the way that oftentimes architects and designers work in practice because we often, when we're working with a client, we also are trying not to overstate a final solution uh, because there's always like back and forth iterative engagement with the client that we want to keep those lines of communication and engagement and show different possibilities and and without you know, with yeah so so I think in some ways that is that can be part of the process I don't think everyone in a studio setting needs to do that like um, I think in my view, like I, I, I do understand that not, not all design studios are, are participatory, participatory engagement studios. Uh, let, 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 let me uh, kind of uh, join this yeah. conversation because this is a very much important theme of my research studio since five years ago. Because the, one of the dilemma the student will have is that the lackness of the reality is sort of meaning you don't have a client, 
you don't have somebody to bounce back your thoughts, right? No matter if it's a local community or residential project, there's like my have I have a client who say, I want to have a Mediterranean style house. And it's really interesting to work with them and then kind of generate the project together. But you will miss that. That's the nature of this uh, sort of a, a design studio. But at the same time, you know, that when you actually initiate the design in any circumstances, you are asked to observe the situation and analyze it and then propose point of view. And then examine that with a context and the situation and the people there. But uh, then kind of start to adjust and develop the project much further. So in your case, you are missing the client. However, uh, that's why I ask actually uh, every student to produce this kind of ecology diagram to see that what kind of value the project and your proposal can cause to actually see your project, not only the point of design or the form, but to see it in a value system exists around the context of the project. So in the other words, you are ask to produce your own reality by proposing your, your alternative reality, let's say, by proposing your projects, how your project can actually engage the reality and alter it and generate a different value system to make something better. So that, that's the uh, key point. The, until two years ago, when we were doing uh, co-housing, co-working studio project, we, I ask actually each student to write the business plan, business program. So that way you can actually justify as a, uh, how to say the founder of the business to pitch. And in order to pitch and let the investor to understand how it's worth to build it, you have to prove the context and then competitors and how it is different from the other competitors and what kind of value can provide. Same thing, you have to kind of a pitch, it's a pitch from you, okay? And it's pitched to this certain situation around the disaster, around the fire. And then you are responsible to prove that there's a certain value. That's why you are doing this kind of a, a other conceptual study to seek your way of understanding how the fire uh, kind of works and what kind of e social ecology it will create. And then you need to find the point that you need to uh, address. So that will help you at least to actually work, create your own point of view and create your own reality and deal with sort of a so design in that realm. So it's very important and we can continue to discuss about it. So that's the difference from this studio versus the other studio or the, the studio versus uh, the reality. But still, I think it's somewhere situate the studio somewhere between the outside world and the uh, studio studio setting. So you know, I'm very happy talk to talk about this for mm. forever, but... <laughs> But uh, this is very important point, I think. Sorry, Kian. No, 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 I think that that's that's well put. <laughs> but uh, thank you again, uh, Kian. I'm so uh, I'm so happy that you could do this in person. I mean, online. I didn't want to put you on the video. Okay, we have a video from last year, but uh, you know. So thank you, and uh, uh, student, please stay. Uh, we need to just a little bit more work to do, but uh, uh, please uh, say thank you to Kiango for <laughs> our fantastic talk. And uh, let's say, Kao, you want to say something? No. Oh, okay. No, just saying thank you. Thank, thank you, Kian. Thank you. A, a thank pleasure you. to be here. And yeah, certainly looking forward to seeing like the research and, and proposals. Thanks. Thank you.